Uh, the government announced that it had signed a, an agreement between Oxford University and AstraZeneca to make up to 30 million doses available by September uh, for the UK. Um, has that been accomplished? No. So that 30 million doses was assuming a linear um, yield on scale up. So what happens is you, when you start, when you, when you manufacture these vaccines, you start basically at test tube levels and then you scale up sequentially um, and ultimately get to one or 2,000 litre scales. And so the projections that were made in good faith at the time um, to get to 30 million doses in September was assuming that absolutely everything would work and that there were no um, hiccups at all uh, in terms of how you scale up from basically uh, microlitre scales through to 1,000 or 2,000 litre scale. Um, and it hasn't gone linearly. Um, and it's not through lack of care and attention or availability of equipment or anything like that. It's just this normally takes a very long time. Sure. So um, the answer is no, but, it's, but it, it is now at the 1,000 um, litre scale and that is working. So I'm, I'm quite sure that we've got the, the, um, the process which is now there. But it isn't, this is this, you know, we're growing live cells. It's, it's not a straightforward um, um, activity. And I have to say, the, the skills in the UK in, in advanced manufacturing are world class. So it's, it is challenging. But just to be clear, to, um, to update that figure, so it was um, thought appropriate in May to make an assessment of what we would have available on the stocks, as it were, in September for the purpose of reassuring people that as soon as a vaccine uh, was licensed, was approved, it could be deployed at scale. Um, so uh, as of now, and if you want to kind of forecast perhaps six weeks uh, ahead, how many doses uh, of the Oxford AZ vaccine will be available in the UK? Well, as of now, we've, we've got um, low numbers of, of million doses uh, in bulk drug substance, not vials. And the third batch of the 1,000 litre um, manufacturing is underway now. So that will give us another, that should get us up to, probably up to about 4 million doses that we should have by the end of the year. 4 million by the end of the, the year? Yeah. And then it, again, it, it then increases because Again, it's, it's all about having got to that scale, you can then run it quickly. But, but the it's point the challenges of, the, of getting to the 1,000 litre scale. But the point of the communication of the 30 million um, was to convey the idea that we were getting ahead of the curve, that we were anticipating the, the need for a mass vaccination programme as soon as uh, a vaccine were, uh, was approved. This was done in advance of many of the, the trials that we've been hearing about. But if we are in the, in the prospect of having low numbers of millions, then that's not going to be available uh, for mass deployment the moment that uh, we, as we hope, get approval, is it? Well, there are various things. We, we have to look at the data, it has to go through the regulators, and then it has to be, start to be deployed. The earliest possible time to look at the data is going to be late November to December. Then it's still got to go through the regulatory period. So actually, we're going to have more vaccine than we'll be able to deploy, is my expectation, um, because it will take some time, even millions. Trying to vaccinate millions of adults uh, in this um, pandemic is, again, a heroic achievement. It's not been done at this scale before. I'm sure. So I don't think vaccine supply is going to be, is going to be the right limiting step. No, no one does that. But when do you expect to see, or hope to see, uh, the first deployment uh, of vaccines to the public? Well, deployment, again, is a health-led activity. If I put on my rose-tinted specs, I would hope that we will see positive interim data from both of Oxford and from Pfizer-BioNTech um, uh, in early December. And if we get that, then I think we've got a possibility of, uh, of deploying by year-end. Um, if not, we'll have to just continue running the studies, as Andy described um, earlier, until we get that efficacy data, which is acceptable to the regulators, and then you can start deploying um, early next year. Okay, but let's take the, uh, the rose-tinted um, view that we might have it available for deployment by the year end. 
So by the year end, how many doses of vaccines will we have uh, in stock? So we will have, um, as I said, low single doses, single digit doses for Oxford and um, up to, um, um, I think up to 10 million doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech. By that, that date of the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Jeremy Hunt. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Ms. Bingham. Um, we've obviously been hearing from some very eminent scientists at Oxford and Imperial this morning. They naturally use quite cautious language. Um, but I think what the public wants, and I wonder whether you could help us with, is just a stronger sense of the likelihood of a vaccine riding to the rescue and getting us out of a hole uh, during the course of the next year. So could I just ask you, in very layman's terms, to tell us, as you look ahead, what do you think the percentage chances are that we will get a vaccine at some stage in the next year that will wipe out coronavirus? Well, to wipe out coronavirus, I think very slim. To get a vaccine that has an effect of both reducing illness and reducing mortality, uh, very high. Because we, again, we've got, if you look at the data that's been generated so far um, by multiple different uh, vaccines and, and uh, companies so far, actually the data is pretty good. What we can see is pretty compelling immunogenicity data um, from these two dose vaccination um, regimes coming from whole inactivated viral vaccines, adeno vaccines, mRNA vaccines, and the protein adjuvant uh, vaccines, all of which the UK has access to. And what we don't know is to what extent does that immune response that we have seen correlate with protection against disease. But um, do I expect that those vaccines, even if they don't 100% protect against infection, are they likely to actually reduce the severity of illness and reduce the levels of death? My view, and I'm not a clinician, is yes, we will see a vaccine that will reduce illness and will reduce death. Okay, second question, if I may, just again in lay very much in layman's language, but what do you think the chances are that by next Easter, here in the UK, uh, we, will have, we will have a vaccine and been able to give it to everyone who is most vulnerable from catching COVID? So again, the deployment and the, um, the actual vaccination process itself is handled by health, not by me. Uh, we have got two more vaccines coming through um, in the first half of next year. So it's the Janssen um, Ad26 vaccine and the Novavax adjuvanted protein vaccine. And we will have the AstraZeneca neutralizing antibody vaccines all in the first half of next year. Um, some of those actually um, closer to Easter. So that, together with the Pfizer-BioNTech and AstraZeneca Oxford vaccines, gives me... More than 50% you know, confidence? Uh, I would be, but I am a naturally optimistic person. But and more than 50% confidence been... that we will, by the early summer, have a vaccine that we can give to all vulnerable people. I appreciate this as you being yes. optimistic, but I just want to give a sense as to, to what you actually believe, um, with the caveat that you're a natural optimist, but you think we could be in a situation by the Easter early summer where all the vulnerable people in the country have got a vaccine that will have some impact on reducing uh, the dangers of coronavirus? That is my view, yes. Thank you. 50%. Uh, Tawo Owotemi. Thank you, Chair. My, question, my questions are around the distribution and administration of the vaccination. So um, we know that UK pharmaceutical supply chain could be better robust. So um, what challenges do we currently expect um, in terms of a supply chain, how resilient is that supply chain needed for um, the distribution of COVID-19 vaccine? Um, my other question is also about um, the administering of the, um, the vaccination. So we've heard there'll be changes to the way the vaccines are administered. So could you let us know what regulatory changes um, as they've been put in place and how balanced are these um, changes with regards to safety? Um, but also we know that there is an NHS staffing shortage um, in your opinion, do you think NHS has the capacity to readily deliver this max vaccination programme if it was ready? And what is the estimated number of staff do you think is needed in order for them to actually reach this um, capacity? And how do you plan to increase that capacity? So all those questions. <laughs> Sorry, so, I know. Uh, um, there's, 
there's a lot of questions there, and I'm afraid I'm not the right person to be asking about the detailed deployment, because my job finishes at the point at which we have the vaccines that are ready and regulated and available to use. They, then I hand over to the Department of Health, and they are responsible for all the, um, the actual deployment um, activities. Our team supports the Department of Health because, of course, this is a massive challenge. Um, Two-dose regimes, as well as flu, because they can't be co-administered. So we are asking vulnerable people to go through three different vaccination um, uh, visits, which has, again, never been done at this scale before. And also, we're not able to tell them precisely when a vaccine might come, what is the nature of the vaccine in terms of the data, because we don't know what these vaccines may, um, or the effects of these vaccines in different groups. So whether or not um, they do actually work in the elderly cohorts, or do they work better in younger people with underlying disease, or do they work better in black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities. We don't know that. And so the, the, the information we give to health is a lot of very ambiguous, these are the different scenarios of what you need to expect. And I have to say, um, what I've seen, which is obviously I'm sitting at the sidelines, is there is a massive um, effort. It looks like it's been beautifully run, and it is, but it don't cut, be under any illusions. This is very complicated. And especially when you add the cold chain requirements, these vials are coming in multi-dose vials, um, especially the RNA vaccine, the BioNTech vaccine, um, has a short um, shelf life. So um, the complexity of administration is, is phenomenal. And I think what you will need to do is to ask the Department of Health to come in and ask, ask Well, them. we have Professor Lim. Perhaps um, um, Professor Lim might um, comment on that, um, to Taiwo's question. Oh, thanks. Hi, good morning. Uh, so I am also, unfortunately, not the right person to explain to you the details of the deployment. I have seen, as Kate Bingham has said, uh, I have also seen some of what's been planned, and it looks highly comprehensive, very professional. Uh, but if you want the details, then you really need to ask uh, Department of Health and NHS uh, England regarding the exact deployment schemes. Okay. All right. Taiwo. Yes, no one's involved with regards to the supply chain um, management of the, the vaccine then? Well, what we have been responsible uh, for... No, 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 I don't... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Kate. Yeah, no, I, so I, I think you're misunderstanding. I, I think we're, st we're saying here that neither myself, and I speak on behalf of Kate for a moment perhaps, that neither of us are involved in managing this, but that does not mean there is nobody involved in managing it. There is a huge team that we are aware of that are managing this and doing, as far as I can see, a fantastic job in what is a very, very difficult uh, project. Uh, but we're not the right people to ask regarding the detail that you're asking about. But I can say that we have got um, 150 million vials, stoppers, and overseals, um, and we have the supply chains in place um, for future vials, so that we've gone back from saying how many future vials in the case of revaccinations, how many future vials do we need, and then do we have enough tubular glass, which is what is, um, is used to make the vials, and even back to the, to the question, do we have enough of the borosilicate sand to be able to make the, the tubular glass? So that the, the supply chain, as far as getting to the point of having vaccine to deploy, is under control. Thank you. Thank you, Taiwo. Sarah Owen. Thank you, Chair. Um, Kate, I was going to ask a question about the rollout of vaccines, but um, as you've already said that that's not your department, I was going to ask then about the supply chains um, and possibly the rollout for vaccines for COVID-19. Um, would the end of the transition period with the EU affect this in any way, whether it's the supply chain or the rollout? And even if there is a deal between the UK and the EU, how might this affect vaccine rollout or supply chain in Great Britain and Northern Ireland? So, um, caveated by yep. all the facts that it's not me, um, it, we've put all the Brexit plans in place. So, in fact, for deployment, um, there is a separate um, schedule for deploying vaccines to Northern Ireland. So, in terms of the actual uh, uh, logistics of shipping vaccine, um, if, for example, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which is coming from um, Belgium, Shipping that, there, there's a separate supply chain that goes directly to Northern Ireland. 
and then a separate supply chain that comes in um, to, to England, which then gets distributed out to uh, Wales and Scotland. So it's been planned. It, it's certainly an additional complexity, as if this wasn't complex enough. Um, but again, I think it's under control. Okay, thank you. We've even actually, I might just add, just to be sure that we have vaccine onshore um, in time, we're even um, using air freight in some cases so that we can be sure, again, it's more expensive, but then we have that additional certainty that we know the vaccine is uh, not um, caught up in any uh, um, blockages anywhere. Thank you, Kate. Sarah, is that okay? Okay, uh, Dean Russell, and then Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Chair. Um, my questions were also going to be around rollout, but I do have one big question uh, connected to that, which hopefully you can help. One of the conversations I've heard recently are around concerns around taking the vaccine. Uh, I don't mean extremes of anti-vaxxers, which obviously is a very dangerous movement, but actually around just the general public where they've said, look, you know, this has gone through very quickly. You know, I've got to inject something into myself that we're unsure of. Uh, could you just give me some reassurance on two parts? One is that it will be safe. And secondly, has there been discussions at this point around a really sophisticated and strong communication strategy to reassure the public that, you know, should they start to be able to take a vaccine, that it will be OK for them? Great questions. Um, so the, the reassurance of will it be safe? Um, are, and then Andy talked a little bit about this earlier, the, the safety testing um, and the safety standards that are being uh, imposed on these vaccine trials are no different from any new therapeutic or new vaccines um, that are being developed. So there's been no uh, diminution of standards or shortcuts or anything. So from a perspective of, uh, are we using the gold-plated world-class standards for safety monitoring? Yes, we are. We also are benefit in the UK for um, because everybody has an NHS number so we can actually do real-time uh, uh, pharmacovigilance which is how is the how are those people who've received the vaccine uh, performing so that we can monitor to see the, the long-term safety of these studies um, as, a, as an aside I've joined a vaccine study so that if I thought there was um, concerns about safety I wouldn't have done so and I have done so and I can be quite clear that the treatment that I've been getting and the the care with safety is absolutely paramount. So that goes back to, that's your first question. The second bit of about the comms is there's two aspects. From a vaccine task force perspective, yes, we have a, a broad strategy for public education just to tell people about how the vaccines work, what progress we've made, what are the strategies we're using to tackle some of the issues, because our goal is to establish the UK as a global leader in vaccine R&D and, and to encourage international communication. And ultimately, this will be great of, um, industry for the UK economy. So our strategy to communicate and collaborate means that I've talked to all sorts of um, groups, whether it's women's groups, civil society groups like Global Justice Now, industry, clinical, manufacturing groups, as well as international groups like the World Bank, and Gates, I've given more than 100 interviews. I've written in Nature, I've written in Lancet. Um, we've now got nine podcasts of which um, on Spotify and Amazon, where we specifically tackle some of these issues about safety, um, how do we get different communities into clinical trials, how are we manufacturing it, what is the role that the UK is playing in the international community. So um, we're doing um, a sort of a narrow communications um, uh, activity from the vaccine task force but of course the broader vaccine communications again will be led by Department of Health as part of their broader vaccination and deployment um, uh, campaigns and communications and that will address the vaccine hesitance because a lot of vaccine hesitance is not to dismiss people's concerns because they're right to be concerned and it's a complicated fast-moving field um, and we need to address the concerns and allow people to have their conversations with their doctors or their civic leaders or whoever, whoever is trusted that can actually give them advice um, and, and the discussions that would be helpful. So I think we need to be open to it. Thank you. And, and if I may, just a, a couple of related questions. One is um, on the combination. I, I'm pretty confident I asked a question a few months ago in one of our health and social care select committees where I'd heard there was uh, tests of 
a combined vaccine with flu. And I, I heard a comment earlier which seemed to indicate that that's not the case. So I'd just be keen to know whether there is any movement on a combined vaccine. And secondly, uh, related to the combination side of things, how have the tests been done with regards, um, you know, people who are taking other types of drugs? Because, you know, we, we don't all live in a, in a, a COVID-only uh, world. There's lots of other things that people will be taking. I'd just be keen to get reassurance on that. And then very finally, uh, you mentioned about tracking symptoms once the vaccine's out there. I'm conscious that the uh, NHS uh, track and trace app has, has performed very well. I had, I think, the fastest download of any app ever, um, I believe, um, on the App Store. Um, has there been any discussions around using an app to enable people who've had a vaccine to track their um, their side effects, if there are any, or, or their symptoms as they uh, immediately after they take it? Because I know with the flu vaccine, many people report that they don't feel too great for a few days after. Uh, so if you could cover those points, I'd really Thank appreciate you. Okay. it. Thank you. Keep A lot of questions there. Um, so the first one is, um, there are clinical studies, um, small small arms of studies are being run uh, with co-administered with flu, but the bulk of the, ma of, the, of the main phase three studies are not currently being run with flu. So the initial label uh, is not expected to, to allow for co-administration with flu, albeit those are under investigation now. Ultimately, from a vaccine task force perspective, I would like to see a single shot, ideally a pill, or something that doesn't involve a needle, which could combine a flu and a COVID antigen and then stimulate immunity twice. But at the moment, in the likely um, initial label that, that, that the regulators are likely to give will not allow for um, co-administration with flu. By this time next year, I'm sure the answer will be it will be, but it's not yet. That's your first question. Co-administration with other drugs, um, yes, because the point of the trials is to include as diverse a group of people in the clinical trials so that we can be sure that the vaccines can work in all people who are most vulnerable. So in fact, we do and have, have pushed very hard to enrich for black, Asian and minority ethnic communities in our vaccine trials because they are at specific risk from COVID infection. We are also enriching for elderly and those people with underlying serious diseases. All of those, especially the people with underlying serious diseases, will be taking medicines. And we want to be sure that these vaccines are safe in those groups and that the vaccines are effective. So yes, we will be, um, that is in, in hand. And again, we need to wait to see the data to see whether or not the vaccines actually work. But absolutely, that is being investigated. Um, as far as tracking, that again, really is a uh, Department of Health issue because the MHRA is an agency um, within the Department of Health. And the different tools that they use um, is, is up to them as how to do it. And whether or not the track and trace then feeds into um, the electronic um, medical records, um, I don't know. But that ultimately is obviously what we want. We need to be able to get to a position using the latest AI um, tools that you can actually identify how the vaccines are performing in the wild, as we call it, um, to be sure that they are doing what we expect them to be doing and that they are safe. Thank you. Thank um, you. Perhaps uh, I could... Chairman, could I just add something about the surveillance? Do, yes. Professor Lin. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so the UK is a world leader in actually surveillance of vaccine efficacy and safety. We've done that for uh, the flu vaccines in children and shown that it creates indirect protection in adults. That's a first in the world. Uh, we've shown that there are uh, replacement serotypes when you give the pneumococcal vaccine, and that's the first in the world. And we have very, very good systems for surveillance. Uh, so surveillance covers three areas, really. One is safety, which is ongoing, and there's a passive and an active surveillance system. Uh, and then there's a second looking at vaccine effectiveness. So the clinical trials will give us some information as described by um, Andy Pollard and, and, and so others earlier, but they won't give us all the information that we need. And we need more information on subgroups of patients and particular outcomes such as hospitalization or, or mortality. And these things will come from uh, good surveillance systems which are already in place for flu, for example, and will be adapted for COVID as well. Uh, and the third area is vaccine coverage. We need to know where the vaccine goes to, 
who's having the vaccine and how we can adjust vaccine coverage accordingly. And that's already in place. Uh, so uh, quite apart from whether there's going to be an app or not, there are already all these embedded systems uh, in the UK, world class, uh, and I think we're going to get lots of good uh, information from those. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Lim. Let me go to Barbara Keeley and then to John Butler. Your music there we are. Yes, yeah, I, no, I'm sorry, yes. Um, to Kate Bingham, you, you mentioned earlier the cocktail of antibodies, and we heard earlier from Professor Horby about how important that might be if given to people in care homes, giving them some protection for a number of months at least. I understand that that requires action by the Department of Health and Social Care, but if steps were taken to get trials of, off the ground, how ready are we to get that out in terms of, of supply, I guess, and how many vulnerable people could be protected? You know, we clearly have hundreds of thousands of people in care homes, so how many could we protect? Excellent. So, in fact, um, we are um, running, just starting those studies now. So, um, AstraZeneca's cocktail, which is particularly good for prophylaxis, because it's been, it's been, these antibodies have been engineered to have a much longer half-life than a naturally occurring antibody, so that we're expecting and hoping that these will have at least a six-month protection. So um, AstraZeneca has filed um, its CTA um, already. I think we're due to hear about approvals today or imminently. And they're running two different prophylactic studies. One is um, targeting those people who are at high risk of exposure. So whether that those are people in um, hospitals or prisons or transport or any, any public facing role where they're at high risk. And then we've got a second, we, AZ, have got a second um, study that is uh, under or being planned that will do to start shortly, um, which is they've called a storm chaser study where you, you, I, somebody gets in a, in a care home or a meat packing factory, um, ha, test positive and then you vaccinate all the people around them. So we've got these two prophylactic studies underway, um, and, um, and, and so we will hope to get early or efficacy data and safety data that, the, that these vaccines or the, these prophylactic uh, antibodies work probably in the first quarter, um, of, by, by the end of the first quarter of next year. And at that point, we will have um, prophylactic antibody cocktail doses uh, negotiated and completed. And I can't give you numbers yet because we're still actually negotiating on that. But the goal is to actually ensure that all immunosuppressed people and people who are unable either to respond to a vaccine or for those people who need a immediate protection, such as healthcare workers or people, or military, who need to be protected at once because these two dose vaccines typically take about six weeks to mount a full immune uh, response. Um, we would hope to have um, sufficient vaccine to cover all those immunosuppressed people, whether they're going through um, solid organ transplants, bone marrow transplants, very severe cancer chemotherapy where their immune immunity is uh, uh, eliminated. And, and Neil Hanvey talked about blood cancers. I mean, those sorts of things are, those people are the ones that we want to protect. Because again, my role is to ensure that we have vaccines for everybody, not just people who, who can respond to vaccines. So although this is a short-term prophylaxis, it's not a, vac a, a vaccine per se, it is the only, at least, current way of, of treating these people. Thank you. And, and just the final thing then, I, yeah. I know you say you, you can't provide the numbers yet and it's being negotiated, but would it be at a scale where we could protect all the people in care homes? Well, not necessarily care homes, because at the moment, uh, we don't know that people in care homes can't receive well, vaccines. Vulnerable people who need it, yeah. Oh, so, so focused on the immunosuppressed, maybe I'll let um, Wei Shen talk about that. But the, the, the focus is absolutely that we can, we'll have sufficient vaccine to, to uh, treat all those who are immunocompromised and unable to receive vaccines. If it turns out, for example, that over 80s, just we can't get a sufficient immune response, then we'll need to broaden out the, the scope of how many doses we will need. And that is one of the reasons that we have now issued a request for proposals to build a bulk antibody manufacturing plant in the UK. Thank because you. Because we recognise this is an ongoing need. Thank you. We're, um, we're running out of time, so we'll need to keep answers uh, short, if I may. But uh, do, do you want to add anything to that, Professor Lim? 
Uh, no, no, there's nothing else to add to that, I don't think. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll go to Dawn Butler and then Catherine Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. Um, two very quick questions. Um, Kate, you talked about the complexity of the administration um, of, of the injections. Are you concerned about the impact of the virus because of the complexity associated with it? And the second question is, um, what's your communication strategy like, i.e. with um, different languages, including BSL, and we know that people who have sort of learning difficulties as well have um, been affected in higher numbers in regards to the death rate of the virus. Thank you very much. I don't understand the first question about the complexity of administration and what impacts that have on the virus. I don't know what that means. You talked about um, requiring people to attend three times, you know, once for a flu virus and then twice for uh, the coronavirus injections. I think it's um, one and then seven days there's another one. And so sort of that complexity of requiring somebody to attend three times, if they don't attend three times, you know, what effect will that have on the effectiveness of the virus? So it won't be as effective if you don't take, it's like all these things, if you don't take the full course, it won't be as effective as if you do. So um, it doesn't mean it won't be, have any effect, but it won't be as effective. And that's, that's again, part of the trial. So we can actually look, look at, the immune, and, and Oxford has done this, can look at the immune response and the immunogenicity after one dose, and then they did it again after looking at two doses. And while there was a good response after one dose, there was a, is a very profound effect after two doses. So I think if you don't complete the course, that's a problem. So again, we need to make sure that that happens. Um, in terms of languages, yes, it's translated into the, the, the um, information about COVID and the vaccines is translated, I think, into nine different languages. So in the, um, and we've been specifically working with different um, ethnic um, groups around the UK um, so that often they're not looking at UK, mainstream UK media. They're not necessarily you know, listening to BBC. They'll, and so we're making sure that we're actually t um, communicating in the media channels that are actually suitable for all uh, communities in the UK, because we need to make sure that everybody has access to these vaccines, not just those people who are, you know, at the front, pushing in at the front of the queue. So, Wei Shen, do you want to comment on, on, on the um, uh, communications at all? I, I guess I'll just uh, add to that, that there is a strong communications uh, strategy, which we'll, I think we will see more and more of in the coming weeks, so timing is important here. And part of the communication strategy is to try and tackle the inequalities that we know exist in our society. We've seen inequalities in many ways, and uh, tackling the inequalities will require vaccine deployment to be implemented in a way that is flexible and appropriate to those uh, patient groups or person groups where inequalities exist. So all of that's being taken into account. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. And just um, BSL as well, British Sign Language, are we working with all of the key organisations? Professor Lim? Um, I don't know that it's in specific detail, but I would hope that uh, Public Health England have got that in hand as well, yes. Perhaps uh, you so might I write I do know we have, um, we have instructions in, again, this is, I think, out of PHE, we've got instructions in, in Braille and also instructions in, for people with learning difficulties. I don't know about BSL. Perhaps you'll uh, come again, back to that's... us uh, on that or ask your colleagues to do so. Uh, Catherine Fletcher. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Professor Lim, just a little shout out as a Nottingham University graduate <laughs> to their marvellousness. Um, this has been a really fascinating session. I would like to almost kind of step back slightly from the immediate crisis response to the pandemic and maybe refer back to some of your opening remarks, um, uh, Kate, about the investment that's going into both manufacturing capability and UK science. Is there going to be a positive legacy for this, uh, from this effort from the UK Vaccines Task Force? Or is that frankly something that's just got lost in the heat of battle at the moment? I would be um, incredibly disappointed if there wasn't a very positive legacy coming out of this, because the UK is absolutely batting above its weight and, and performing in an incredibly strong way in the global community. Not just that we've been able to assemble manufacturing capabilities in the UK very quickly without, I might say, a strong uh, sort of dedicated vaccine manufacturing um, uh, capacity in the UK to begin with, but the speed at which we've been able to put these in place 
and the flexibility with which we um, will have future capability for vaccines, again, I think is really important. So we will have whole inactivated viral capability. So the next time we have a nasty pandemic virus, assuming it can be grown, which is not 100%, but it's probably reasonably likely, we will be able to generate very quickly whole inactivated viral vaccines for, the, for a future um, virus. And so that's something which is absolutely squarely in our sites of, of pandemic preparedness. Um, we will have the adeno capability. So again, for the, for the adeno vaccines, they, they, both we're making those now, but we will have, we've got that capability in the future. And again, in VMIC, which is the Harwell site, they will have surge flexible capacity to make 70 million doses within six months of a pandemic. So again, we've, we've, and we've radically expanded that. So that was 3 million doses, and we've taken that up to 70 to say, we have to be better prepared for future pandemics, and it has to be at a population scale, in case that's where, where JCVI and the Department of Health decide that that's how we need to vaccinate. Um, and then, of course, we've got the Braintree site, um, and, uh, and then we've got which and we've done all the work on the mRNA vaccines. So I'm actually pretty happy that we are going to come out with a big legacy. We've uh, invested already in skills and training, um, and that's something that we hope will then help create uh, a lot of uh, jobs. And again, that should be around the UK, not not concentrated in in the, the southeast. Um, and in fact, the cell and gene therapy. Um, sector is predicting 6,000 jobs by 2024, um, mostly in manufacturing and bioprocessing. So I do think this is an important legacy, um, not just to show that we are organized, we can do things quickly, we can make decisions, we can be uh, broad and agnostic in terms of the scope of different vaccines that we are able and willing to look at. But also, I think the other key legacy is about the role that we've played internationally, because this is not a... Um, a pandemic that just uh, affects the UK. The virus does not respect national borders. We have to make sure that everybody around the world who is vulnerable has access to the vaccine. And again, I think the UK has played an absolutely central role in ensuring that that um, uh, has happened. And what I would like to see uh, as a permanent legacy is that we have a permanent uh, global uh, facility so that you know, nine months in, COVAX is still uh, in the early stages of getting its vaccines organized, whereas really they should be at the, at the front edge of this. And that's what I think we need to ensure happens for the next time. Thank you. Catherine? The, yeah, I, I'm, Professor Lim, um, it, there's a dark days, you know, there's a very important vote coming for us today in the House. But if I could ask you to look forward, especially from an educational institution, um, I observed that lots of people that are solving this problem are not the classic kind of Professor Brainiac white-coated, uh, grey-haired, um, uh, you know, cartoon professor. Is that something that you're seeing? Do you think that there's a legacy for encouraging diversity in STEM, be that women, people from different backgrounds? I'd love your reflection on that. Thank you. I think um, it's, it's been really uh, challenging for academics as well as clinicians, and I'm a clinician and an academic. Um, Certainly, the academic community has has put its weight behind understanding COVID, and we have come a huge distance, and the UK has contributed enormously to that understanding. Uh, that, by its nature, will have pulled a lot of the people into uh, science. My two sons are at university, so this is an anecdote, and they're both in science, and they're telling me that they are friends and their, their colleagues are encouraged and inspired by the fact that science has actually made a big impact on this pandemic and how we manage the pandemic. And that in its own uh, will be enormously encouraging for all peoples, whatever their backgrounds, uh, to join science and to make a difference in society. So I think, yes, this will have a positive impact. And also, I might just add, I mean, as part of some of the interviews I've given, I've had reach outs from schools asking whether or not I'd be willing to talk to them about what we've been doing at the Vaccine Task Force as an example of how you can use science to actually change the world. And I'm obviously excited about that and especially excited about bringing women into, the, into science. Thank Rise you. of the nerds. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's very important. Let, let me just uh, ask a question on that, which I think is on the minds uh, of some people having read some reports uh, in the press. In terms of communication, um, you gave a presentation uh, of the, the leading vaccines uh, to a group of investors. Um, was, that, uh, was that an approved presentation that you made? Approved by the, the government? Yes, it was. Yes, all, all communications that I do on behalf of the Vaccine Task Force, um, I seek approval for both, seek both approval for doing um, the event itself, but also the materials that are shared at that, whatever the event is. And so who, yes, it was approved. And who gives that approval? Bayes. It's the, there's a, a Bayes process. I, I ask for it and then I get told yes or no. Uh, and in that uh, presentation that you gave, did you disclose anything that was proprietary that was not in, uh, available to be in the public domain? No, and th the, there have been a lot of nonsense reports and inaccurate, and I'm afraid to say irresponsible reports, suggesting that I did. Um, what I described was the landscape of vaccines. So there's over 250 vaccines, with about 50 in the clinic um, already. So I think of this a bit like a race, like the Grand National. There are lots of hurdles, lots of runners, lots won't get to the end of the race, and it's all being done very quickly. And so what I described in that particular uh, presentation was this is the overall landscape. These are the six vaccines that we have chosen for the UK. But of course, we are also monitoring other vaccines which are relevant to the UK vaccines that we have selected. So for example, um, GSK, uh, we've, GSK Sanofi is one of the vaccines that we um, have selected for our portfolio. And the key aspect of, of that vaccine is a protein, an adjuvanted protein is GSK's adjuvant, and in that adjuvant has worked very well in Shingrix at, sh at showing strong immunogenicity in the elderly. So it's something that's a, an important aspect for this pandemic. But there are two other vaccines that are also using the GSK adjuvant, which is Clover and Medicargo. So those are two um, companies that I highlighted as being ones that we are monitoring because we hope to learn something about what they are doing with this vaccine, which might be efficacy in different clinical cohorts, or it may be a safety signal. So those are ones we watch. We also look at the other mRNA vaccines, because again, we've selected the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, but there are other vaccines like Moderna and CureVac, and also the vaccine from Imperial. So those are also vaccines which we continue to review because it relates and we may learn things that will be relevant for um, the, the vaccines that we've chosen for the UK. Thank you. And finally, okay. No, finally? Well, I was just going to say, finally, a key thing that really matters is we can't stick, we, we can't have these vaccines which are um, all delivered by needles, that require cold chains, that require healthcare professionals. We need vaccine formats which are easier to deploy. And so we've, and I've written about this and I've talked about this, and in fact, I talked about it in the, at the last select committee. We need to have new types of vaccines. So other vaccines that we are monitoring, which I discussed at, the, um, at that presentation, among other places, are some of the oral vaccines, like Vaxart and Simvivo, which could potentially get away from the needs of cold chain needles and could be scaled up quickly. So those are the things that, I th again, I think it's important that people understand this. And it demonstrates that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is making a selection of what we think are most promising, but um, also mon managing the and monitoring the landscape. So nothing commercially sensitive, nothing confidential. There was an error on the slide because I, there were footers that suggested they were confidential, and that, I'm afraid, was my fault. I was working too fast, and there was nothing confidential, and those footers should not have been there. Okay, thank you. And a final um, question for me. On the 4th of uh, October, Kate Bingham, you said that um, people keep talking about the time to vaccinate the whole population, but that's misguided. Uh, this is going to be an adult-only vaccine for people over 50, focusing on health workers and care home workers and the vulnerable. Um, is, that, is that still your view? So, my, I was, the, the bit that I was challenging was that all, and which didn't quite get reported uh, like that, was that all adults would be uh, vaccinated before Easter. That was my question. And my personal view of that is that's not likely, because I think all adults uh, it may not be necessary. And I think we heard from the other professors that there will need to be um, evidence that it makes sense to, to and this, and Wei Shen can talk about this, is to 
who should be receiving vaccines. As far as children are concerned, again, I think we heard from um, Robin and, and Andy that uh, at the moment there aren't big phase three studies being run in, in pediatrics and children. And so again, the initial vaccinations are not likely to be labeled for pediatrics and children until there are sufficient tests that are done on those cohorts um, to, be, to prove that they are safe and effective. But I might hand that question back to uh, Wei Sheng because he Perhaps, knows uh, much more Pro Professor Lim, in fact, the Secretary of State, uh, in response um, to what was said, said actually this was uh, a decision for ministers, but on advice from the, uh, from the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, of which um, uh, you chair the COVID uh, aspect. Are you clear, have you determined who, if the approvals are given, is going to get the vaccine first? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. We have so far determined that there should be a first phase, and that first phase would be directed at vulnerable people. As you mentioned yourself, Chairman, earlier, there are two ways of using a vaccine. One is to target vulnerable people, and the other is to target people who uh, are involved in transmission, who are maybe younger people who have more social contact and are more mobile. So in the first phase, we will target vulnerable people, uh, because that's where we think we'll have the most impact with the vaccine. Uh, what JC by hasn't decided yet is how to prioritize the rest of the population, because as you've heard, we need to know whether the vaccine works to prevent transmission before we can make such decisions. So no upper limit has been decided as to how much of the population to vaccinate at this point. Uh, we've only determined who should be vaccinated first, uh, which is the vulnerable. But is it your assessment for the period from now until Easter that a majority of the population will not be able to be vaccinated, even if the approvals are given? Uh, will not be able to be vaccinated. That's a question about availability. Correct. Um, so we. Is, is that what you mean? Yes, yeah, so, so you're prioritising who should, who should get it, but the prioritisation, uh, I'm asking, is this based on the, the assessment that most of the population won't be able to get it by Easter because it's not available in the manufactured quantities? Uh, our prioritisation is not based on availability of vaccine or the ability to deploy the vaccine. We base our prioritisation on scientific principles as to who will benefit most. Uh, and that's the usual way that JCBI makes a decision. So we will make a decision based on uh, scientific priorities uh, for the greatest public health benefit. And how those recommendations are translated into implementation, i.e. buying enough vaccine or getting enough people to deploy the vaccine uh, is taken on by others. I understand. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to both uh, witnesses uh, for giving your time uh, this morning, uh, to Professor Lim and to uh, Kate Bingham. Uh, as has been evident from the questions, uh, the work that you do is of absolutely crucial importance uh, alongside uh, the scientists that we heard from uh, earlier. Uh, we all hope that there will be a vaccine that will be effective uh, and safe and able to be uh, deployed. Your work in making sure that that uh, is available to be deployed uh, at scale across the country uh, in your different respects is vital. We're very grateful for that work uh, and the work of your colleagues. Uh, it's now time to draw this session of the Joint Committee uh, to a uh, conclusion. Order, order. Thank you.